Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are diving into the myths of the West, specifically Texas and the connections to the Ozarks. The Ozarks had a significant impact on the Lone Star State that you may not know, including the spooky side of things. We'll get back to that in a minute, but first we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on the Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and most other podcast platforms. So how did some of the more infamous cryptids and uh, folkloric uh, creatures of the Ozarks end up in Texas? Well, I think the first thing we have to understand is that the Ozarks, both Arkansas and Missouri in particular, and also Eastern Oklahoma, were a big part of Texas culture and Texas history with those connections, both before and after the Alamo. So realistically, more than just the wagon trains went south. We'll pick up uh, with Ozarkers and their uh, spooky stories in Texas um, in a minute. But first, we want to invite everyone to like, follow, etc. cetera, um, Dark Ozarks on all the platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and we encourage you to follow the podcast. We would like to invite you to become a Dark Ozark subscriber on Facebook. On the Facebook page, click subscribe. You, you will have to have your login information ready and join um, the Dark Ozarks behind the scenes for only $4.99 a month. So come along with us on investigations, deep dive research, and topics that quite frankly are at times too controversial for public view. The next 100 subscribers on Facebook will be entered in a drawing for a free Dark Ozarks t-shirt and an exclusive signed first-run copy of the upcoming book, Dark Ozarks, The Spook Light. So join today to be entered in that drawing. Why else did you subscribe to the private uh, subscribers group? Yes, it does have the, the subscription fee, but you receive exclusive content and behind the scenes information that you don't get elsewhere. It also helps us bring more original content to Dark Ozarks, and we appreciate everyone. And now you can get the Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale on darkozarks.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage everyone to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and their website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com, for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more, not to mention the buildings haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English-style brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, that building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. <laughs> so oh, the, the Ozarks in Texas, a lot of connections, including um, on the paranormal and spooky side. Uh, but it, it goes back a long ways and um, in our last episode, we talked about things coming you know, up to the Alamo, um, but it didn't stop there either. It did not. <clears throat> and you really cannot <clears throat> explore uh, Ozark history or Texas history without really digging into the realities of the Civil War. That's true. Um, it was a crucible for both places. And, and as we, we mentioned on YouTube, and we want to shout out, you can follow us on YouTube, the Texas offered a very unique environment, a unique situation for Confederate forces, and in, in the case of Missouri, Missouri State Partisan Forces, the State Guard, et cetera, and government in exile that really were... Uh, a, a refuge in, in ways that <clears throat> no other state uh, or, or region could afford. Of course, Kansas was off limits for obvious reasons that Kansas was a strong, a union stronghold state. Mm -hmm. uh, Indian territory was up for grabs. Yeah. And Arkansas and Louisiana, something that I think many um, who might be 
learn just learning about the Civil War and or just learning about the trans Mississippi theater, the the war in the far west was that our, both Arkansas and Louisiana were oftentimes invaded by Union troops. That's true. Um, not so much with Texas, though. And Texas uh, was not invaded. And so it really provided uh, a safe uh, region for a lot of, uh, of Confederate, Confederate leaning or simply war refugees uh, from Missouri in particular <clears throat> that, that no other place had. The reality, and of course coming to the, the Burnt District, um, the counties that were, were emptied of, of pretty much everyone in far Southwest Missouri in your neck of the woods, mm -hmm. that most folks, uh, if they uh, weren't rounded up and sent to Kansas City uh, against their will, typically were thought to or known to have headed to Texas. Right. For those that had Southern leanings, they most did. And I, there's several fairly uh, prominent examples um, just off the top of my head. One, one would be... Um, um, Bell Starr's family. The, uh, the Shirley family was a very prominent family uh, with large uh, farm holdings and several businesses and um, lost their son uh, fairly early in the war. He was fighting for the Confederates and he was buried, buried at Carthage, Missouri. And um, about halfway through the war, while, while actually Bell or Myra, she was known as Myra then, um, was acting as a courier and spy for Confederate cars and rangers and regular troops at times, um, the family uh, loaded up and walked away from all of their holdings in Missouri and went to Texas. Um, and for those that want a little bit of that, um, spooky aspect the the legend goes that they uh, disinterred um, their son bud uh and took his body to texas with them and and then reburied him and then um after the war um, while bell star was a outlaw and bandit uh she would go visit her family in texas right and some of the some of the takeaways on that for me, first of all, is the mm, monumental aspect that in this this time of conflict, you have a family leaving their teenage daughter behind to fight a war. Yes. Well, and I'm not so sure with um, Bell's personality. She might not have listened to go. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they might not have had much of a choice, <clears throat> which I, I think really speaks very strongly into sometimes the, the overlooked aspects of frontier or Western culture and the idea that in many of these cases, particularly, at, for example, at this juncture point, individuals oftentimes were going to make these types of decisions that in a in a more of a peacetime or in a uh, more genteel comparatively genteel or settled society that there probably were more stronger gender roles etc being enforced uh bell pretty much said screw it i'm gonna live my life on my terms that's true, and um, and it, it real that really did start with with her brother dying, and yes, and, and uh, pretty much lived her life that way the rest of her life. Yes, the other the other thing that I I think it really speaks to, especially the the um, Missouri 
uh, population exodus, that, particularly in Southwest Missouri, the, the exodus to Texas, is that we're, you know, putting your putting yourself in in their place for a moment. Oftentimes, it was individuals who had comparatively large land holdings, and or they had uh, families, and for example, small children that they were just saying, how do I get my family to a place that's safer than where I'm at right now? Very true. And, and, um, and not all of them were in, even in that situation where the, basically the whole family went. Uh, a lot of times it was just women and children mm -hmm. heading out. And uh, another example from the Burton District of that happening is actually the Raider family after the uh, the Raider Farm massacre. Um, Mr. Raider was actually an officer in the Confederate Army and was off fighting as the old the oldest son was as well. And so Mrs. Raider was at home with their teenage daughters, and when. Uh, the Union troops from Kansas came through and basically were taking all of their uh, supplies and it ended up being a massacre at the farmhouse. Um, afterwards, the Union Army torched the, the farmhouse in part because Mr. Rader was a Confederate officer but then burned everything in a five mile radius. And Mrs. Rader and her daughters loaded up a wagon with what they could salvage and took off for Texas. And none of the Rader family ever came back as did none of Bill Starr's family either. <laughs> Actually, right. um, they, they estimate that only, only about a third of the people who left um, southern Missouri during the war as refugees ever came back to reclaim their land. Yes. And that <clears throat> one of the things that, that just consistently is very striking to me is how different the mining district was from, say, 1861 to 1881. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, as the war was just getting started, of course, the, the district was, was just getting going strong um, at about three locations, really, uh, Granby and uh, French Point and Minersville. And um, then, of course, during the war, it, it pretty well ceased except for at Granby and then, then it was a matter of which army could control it. And then by the time the war is over 10 to 15 years, you have what becomes the largest uh, lead and zinc district in the world and massive amounts of capital coming in because of that. Yes, and <clears throat> in massive numbers of miners um, yes, of men to work in the mine, and it, just the 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 class shift or the culture shift of really creating this mm, modern industrialized center with mm -hmm. enormous amount of investment. Uh, you can see it in so many of the buildings that remain today, mm -hmm. and the 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 reality that the the world that say for example the shirley family knew or many of those individuals for example in in jasper county i think about the the, the residents of the kendrick house who did largely remain to my knowledge mm -hmm. yeah that they would have watched a completely different world supplant their immediate surroundings they did and and that's a good example of of a family that um to, to it as opportunity and basically as mining and stone quarrying uh, exploded around them, 
um, they they turned their holdings into creating a town, Kendrick Town, that catered to the workers and um, uh, then opening other businesses to cater to that population, um, which is something that, yeah, at the time of the war before, you know, nothing like that was going on. So yeah, there, there was a big shift that happened. And I, I still, I find this particularly interesting the further I get into it, but we look at these 1880s, 1890s downtowns. This is when the, the, the motif of Main Street America really mm -hmm. was created. And there's so many. And when I, when I visit with uh, contacts and, and friends, particularly overseas, that they've never been to a small American town. For example, I could show them uh, photos of the downtown I grew up with in, in central Illinois. And they're like, oh my gosh, it looks like Main Street USA and Disneyland. And I'm going, mm -hmm. yes, yes, it does. <laughs> and so many towns did. Well, and to give an idea of it, you know, people think, you know, if they have an idea that all of the Ozarks were very backward and behind the times during this time period, a, a good example is that Crestgees was the first large national department store chain in America. Yes. And started in the 1800s. When they decided to move west of the Mississippi, they did not open a store in St. Louis or Little Rock or Houston or, you know, San Antonio or anywhere, Des Moines, anywhere else, they opened their first store west of the Mississippi in Carthage, Missouri. I did not realize that. That was, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Yeah, the building's still there on the square because of, because of the amount of money that was there. I'm, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna sidetrack for a minute. Um, where was it? Where was it? Because I I'm so on, on, on the on the west side on the west side of the square. Um, about let's see, it would be two what, two doors south of the art gallery. Okay, fantastic. I know just where that is, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm dating myself in saying that. I remember the Kresge store in Peoria, Illinois. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it in fact, it's still in the tile in the entryway. Mm -hmm. It still says Kresge's in it. So, yes. but, um, so yes, uh, the, a lot of the Ozarks were a lot more cosmopolitan than people assume. Yes, yes, they were. And but that then uh, again affected Texas as well. <laughs> and, and and affected with, I, I'd say it was fair to say, Ozark's culture. And then, of course, a, a cross uh, transition of culture that really is best described as um, Southern in, in so many ways. Yes, I, I, would, I would agree. Um, and then, of course, so much of what happened um, during the war in Missouri, particularly, and Arkansas as well, at, towards the end of the war, those forces all ended up in Texas. Yes, and with a lot, a lot of really interesting uh, stories, uh, Shelby's Crossing of the Rio Grande is probably one of my favorites. And mm -hmm. we've, we've talked a lot about Shelby, uh, Joe Shelby, General Joe Shelby, in, mm -hmm. uh, in earlier episodes, actually episodes from about a year ago. But I, I think that his story encapsulates a lot of the honor, the mystique, the romance, as well as just the enormous amount of effort and sacrifice and warrior ethic that came with partisan Missouri and in some degree 
the the whole uh, the whole war, but certainly the war west of Mississippi. Well, definitely, and he does really represent that as far as you know. He was at the Battle of Carthage, uh, which was the first large scale battle in the Trans Mississippi and in Missouri, and basically he ended the Trans Mississippi War by going to Texas and then Mexico. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> And, but and go ahead. I was gonna no, say go uh, Shelby, General Shelby's, uh, you know, military resume. So many, if not all, but so many, vast majority of engagements in Missouri and Arkansas involved Shelby, or Shelby is involved, and yeah. that wasn't by accident. Shelby was, uh, and you could say, an, an uh, unanticipated warrior of the highest class. Definitely, because well, mainly because he, he had no military background where so many of the other officers did. And even his, you know, uh, even his uh, opponents generally, well, it would say that he was the best uh, cavalry officer uh, in the Trans Mississippi. Yes, and I, I find that mm, fascinating and awe-inspiring. Real, pardon me, really, because here's here's an individual who, unlike some others in his some of his contemporaries, it, it appears pretty plain that he was first of all had an incredibly strategic mind yes uh that that was just suddenly and uniquely suited for this role as mm -hmm. as, a, as a general um specifically with cavalry brigade um yes. the iron brigade uh he seems to be incredibly good at leading his men uh at, at inspiring others to follow him mm -hmm. and I, I think as with much of the war in the far west <clears throat> too many aspects of this get overlooked for a variety of reasons uh, oftentimes it's it's the the war west of the mississippi becomes a side note or an addendum to to the war histories the the larger mm -hmm. war histories and Shelby, I think, oftentimes gets even further side noted because he doesn't have a lot of glorious victories to his name, primarily for, for no fault of his own. Right. Although, ironically, um, you know, uh, for a time he controlled three fourths of Missouri. Yes. <laughs> after they had been after the confederates had been driven out of them correct and just that mm, the the fact that his record and his 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 own military success rate or the success rate of, of his brigade being one that it appears to me that he was disinterested or only even if only peripherally interested in his quote unquote military career, he was or how that might be leveraged into a political career afterwards, or how does this look or playing politics with anyone. He just appeared to have this single minded devotion to getting the job done and doing it better than anybody else. Yes. And and. Um, you know, it's it's kind of interesting, not only he, but another. Uh, character we're going to talk about, uh, Jatman, both yes. came from strong federal backgrounds, uh, families and everything, and ultimately made decisions to go with the Confederates. Um, they, uh, with Shelby, it was based on uh, things that happened in bloody Kansas, um, basically being uh, 
attached and, and losing everything, uh, having his businesses and his home burned, uh, that propelled him that direction because he was actually sought at, out by the federals for a commission. Yes. Um, in St. Louis. In St. Louis, yes. And, and um, Jatman, who had another regiment, who ultimately did go to Texas along with Shelby, uh, very similar uh, family background was very strong union. And he actually started the, started the war in the Union Army and then uh, ultimately went with the Confederates because of what was happening in the state and um, he felt that the Union was not protecting the civilians the way they, he, they should. So he ultimately changed horses midstream. Right. And this is, but I think, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I, and I think in both cases, it goes back to, this isn't something that was in either of their minds to be parlayed into a political career or something. It was their sense of honor at that moment. I, I, I really do agree with that. And there was a, a very poignant story uh, that was recorded. It's, uh, it's online at carolellison.wordpress.com. But uh, in 1865 in Austin, Texas, uh, the treasury of the Texas State House was being robbed by a large gang of outlaws. And it's said that Shelby's men stop um, the robbery. The gunfight left blood on the steps of the State House. Shelby's men killed the outlaws and recovered the stolen money. And the mayor of Austin offered the money in the treasury to Shelby and his men in payment for their long service during the war. And they'd essentially not been paid in years. Shelby declined saying, we are the last of our kind. Let us be the best as well. That's true, um, which um, would take a lot of um, internal fortitude, not only on his part, but to enforce that with his men at, under all the circumstances. Um, of course, the flip side is that by this point, he decided to go to Mexico with the idea of empire. So um, it, um, it, it's not as, it's complicated, I think. It is, it is. And uh, elements of Shelby's personality that I mm, really mm, respect, clearly an incredibly passionate, driven individual who, particularly in his younger years, could not be accused of not being hot-headed. Very true. You know, he, he definitely had his hot-headed moments. <laughs> and and one, of, I think, I think it would be fair to say one of those moments, really not just a moment, but a a uh, planned out campaign that he later disavowed. It's interesting to note that Shelby never disavowed the Confederacy um, or his work as a as a Missouri partisan. He did, however, disavow his writing into um, Kansas during, mm -hmm. the, during the, uh, the bleeding Kansas, the bloody war, bound border wars that would take, border war that took place between Missouri and Kansas and uh, leading men in conflict across the border. Very, very true. Um, although he was, he, was, he was always quick to say in later years that, um, well, in fact, uh, in his later years, when he became, uh, was appointed um, U.S. Marshal uh, for Western Missouri at Kansas City, um, which, yes, uh, basically a Confederate general who never surrendered, later appointed uh, U.S. Marshal for half of the state. It also indicates how much he had done after the war to try to uh, reconcile people in the state and he's credited widely for having done so. But um, while he was U.S. Marshal, uh, there was the Pullman strike, yes. Pullman train cars. 
and um, um, he uh, was ordered and dispatched uh, marshals to end the strike. And the argument that that uh, was put to him for not doing that was basically basically states' rights. And um, you know he was quite to say that that argument has been settled. <laughs> you know, so he so he was able to stop fighting the war, even even though he didn't disavow his um, his participation. He was he was able to see beyond that, and that it's over with, and that we you know build and go forward. Um, which I, I think is very admirable considering everything, you know, he'd been through um, and considering that there's a number of people who still seem to, are, you know, argue the, the war <laughs> uh, on, on those lines to this day. Um, when participants and particularly participants to the level of that he was involved can say that issue settled. Now we have to move on. It, that says something. It, and it really does. The yeah, I I feel that the you know, Shelby's post war career really is a lesson in unification without sacrificing culture. Yes. Yes, I mean, and you know, he, you know, he, he, he could walk that line um, as far as recognizing that, but at the same time, turn around and, for instance, when Frank James was tried for uh, murder and bank robbery at Gallatin, basically a show trial, um, to um, basically bring that chapter of Missouri history to an end, um, the star witness for the defense was Joe Shelby. Yeah. I, I, going back to the uh, Pullman strike that I thought was uh, the Pullman strike in 1894. And of course, at this point, Shelby is quite comparatively speaking, elderly. Yeah, I think he would have been in his 60s then i think in his 60s and i think he died at age 67 of pneumonia mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the <laughs> personal friend and fellow democrat missouri governor william stone demanded shelby to explain his actions uh in terms of protecting railroad property and shelby's initial three-word reply of go to hell was reworded to i am acting under the orders of uncle sam ask him <laughs> and you know you you look at his you look at shelby's um strategic mind at work through the war and i then you look at his his work uh after as as marshall etc you really don't see him losing his edge, losing his sharpness no. and his capacity to analyze these situations and react properly or react successfully, which a lot of his contemporaries did not do, were not able to do. That's true, but many of them floundered after the war. Uh, and, and sometimes during the war. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> that much is true too. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, there is a very, to me, a very poignant um, moment that, of course, is is really drawing those, all of those lines together of Missouri Civil War, uh, Texas, and. It's, it's coming down essentially to, to June of 1865. Uh, the Confederate armies, the Confederacy has surrendered. Um, at, mm -hmm. uh, General Lee has surrendered at, at Appomattox. And so it's really uh, you know, a process of communication and sweeping everything up. 
um, Shelby's army is essentially disintegrating around him. They are in Texas and he makes a really unique decision in terms of not surrendering. Yes. Um, just uh, right on to, to Mexico, which of course was in, in the in turmoil at that time um, because uh, they were in the process of rebelling from the French and um, uh, but, I mean, it, there's quite a bit to be said that probably federal government was like, okay, we would rather see Joe Shelby go to Mexico than have to deal with him. <laughs> and um, I think they, there's a, a, a lot of circumstantial evidence indicating that the federal government thought that he would probably back the French, um, mm. which paired better with national political interests. So they, they were like, go Joe. Um, <laughs> but when he got there, that's not what he did. <laughs> <laughs> because he was general shelby yeah <laughs> and you know over over the course of several years uh the hmm, the the plan to settle in mexico didn't really work out and the he and his men either came back to the states or some of his men went to south america uh headed to the Pacific coast and went who knows where. There was a, right. a, a uh, dispersal of forces and, and of men. There is a mm, almost legendary folk hero moment with um, Shelby and his men crossing over the Rio Grande. Yes, there is. Um, they, they basically bury the, the battle flag in the river yes and it, is that uh, i think some some historians do debate whether or not that happened is that correct that's my understanding some wonder whether it really happened although statements by shelby would indicate and certainly by john edwards um you know he he wrote about it um and of course, John Edwards was quite the interesting fellow. Um, uh, before the war, he's basically the one who, you could say, got Shelby's factory and house burned down by <laughs> Jayhawkers, <laughs> but uh, by Thanks, uh, Robert. by um, uh, writing newspaper stories about him. And then um, some people would say that uh, uh, he created the myth of Joe Shelby, although I think that's an overstatement. Um, although later, one thing that he did do is he, he contributed uh, greatly to the folk hero status of Jesse James uh, because he, he uh, regularly uh, wrote articles painting the James brothers as um, folk heroes. Um, right. <clears throat> and what some people probably didn't realize at the time as he was writing that is that uh, he had been uh, an adjunct to Shelby throughout the war and had a lot of contact with Quantrell's Raiders, including the Jameses. So he had known them uh, through the war and then extolled their virtues as folk heroes and then sold a lot of newspapers afterwards. It's a, it's a good combination. It's very American. It, it, it worked well for Edwards, we'll see. Yes. <laughs> And one of the things that to me is very striking about studying so many of these narratives is that 
the the realities of human nature have not changed no in the intervening years um all of the 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 honor but also all of the squabbling all of the drama all of the oh my goodness it's like herding cats to get anything done mm -hmm. um the 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 enmities that are you know show up from one point to another all of that is is within this and you particularly see that with the uh, contentiousness of the state capital or the state government, the Missouri state government in exile. Very true, very true. Claiborne Jackson and the Lieutenant Governor Reynolds um, went to Arkansas um, after the Battle of Carthage and um, set up a government exile, although mainly it it was a liaison with the confederacy um, as another government was already set up in missouri running the state so um in, in a lot of senses it was in name only but and then then the governor jackson died in little rock in 18 late 1862, I believe, or early 1863, um, and um, of cancer. And then Reynolds went on to Marshall, Texas. And basically, even Marshall, Texas, touts itself as having been the capital of Missouri. Right, which I think is really, really fascinating. Of course, it, you know, <clears throat> Marshall Marshall's in a in a unique space, not terribly far, comparatively speaking, from Texarkana and Shreveport. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it it was existing as home of a government in exile for this mm -hmm. time. And Reynolds, um, former uh, position under under uh, Clayborn, was not did not have a drama free interaction with <laughs> the number of uh, important individuals within the the confederate army slash um you know confederate leadership uh namely sterling prize yeah yeah um <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, breaking breaking a, a important rule. You know, of course, here you have the situation where the um, many of the former elected officials of the state of Missouri prior um, to the war, prior to 1861, are essentially attempting to manage a state that they no longer have control of from Marshall, right. Texas, and, yes. and and Reynolds Reynolds decides that. You know, the, the or at least the decision is made that he's going to accompany Price as Price is going to attempt to retake Missouri. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea, I think, certainly the the strategic idea was the the coup that would be involved if they could, if the Confederate Army um, could push for forward. And this Sterling Sterling's raid, I, I still find it interesting that. History uh, calls this a raid. It was a massive invasion army. It was that that pushed uh, up really at extraordinary speed. When you think of the logistics that are involved, mm -hmm. that pushed up from Arkansas into uh, into Missouri, well up through the eastern Ozarks, and then turned toward Jefferson City ultimately to Westport and then um, being unsuccessful in their primary goal. And the primary goal was to establish an incredible coup and retake the state of Missouri, take Jefferson City and put Reynolds as governor, reinstate uh, Reynolds and essentially put the state government, the, the, the Confederate state government back in the capital. And, and, and realistically, for a time period, um, for a short time period, uh, that 
conceivable because they basically controlled everything uh, up almost to St. Louis, yeah. over uh, across the Missouri, over to where Kansas City is now, uh, Westport, until they lost at Westport. And, you know, basically at, at that, for that time, that short time period, everything sat, they controlled virtually everything south of the Missouri River. Yes, yes, they and, did. So um, if, um, if things had gone different at Westport, um, that may well have happened. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of argument that, um, you know, basically um, it, it, it would have gone a lot worse for the Confederate and for Price, for Price at Westport and coming south back to, you know, Baxter Springs and then Newtonia, et cetera, uh, if it hadn't been for Shelby. A hundred percent. And <clears throat> Shelby and the Iron Brigade were an integral part of this entire invasion circle through yeah. the, 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 the southern half of Missouri, for people who are familiar with Missouri. That's a lot of territory. It, it really is. It's you know, a little more than half the, you know, half the state, actually. And um, considering that um, it had been well controlled by the Union for two years, um, it's pretty amazing. It is. Now, that a couple of things, several things uh, came out of the lots of things, but several things that I think are um, worth discussing tonight. One <laughs> is that a, a great um, now almost forgotten folk song yeah. was, uh, was inspired uh, by this, originally sung by Joseph Letty. Uh, a well-known song and dance man with the original Dixie Minstrels in St. Louis, who enlisted the Missouri State Guard in Saline County early in the war, was captured, escaped, and then joined Kelly's infantry. And he had a song uh, <laughs> about Shelby's mule uh, in reference to, to um, Price's raid and to this in... Uh, in 1863 and I, I love the I love the lyrics it makes a great poem um, it is in deeply regional and mm -hmm. I find it absolutely fantastic uh, two it uh, <clears throat> also ultimately led to a <laughs> Uh, 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 <laughs> a, a serious, uh, if, if there ever had been a, uh, a bromance between Sterling Price and, uh, and uh, Governor Reynolds, uh, <laughs> it was over um, with, the, with the raid. And uh, Reynolds ends up going back to Marshall, Texas and writing an open letter that is published in the newspapers, basically saying that Price is incompetent and should be mm -hmm. replaced. And then Price gets busy and publishes his open letter that uh, uh, Reynolds is washed up because he's is just imagining that he's governor of Missouri. And then uh, and then and then Reynolds writes back publicly uh, <laughs> that uh, um, uh, for the first time Sterling Price and the uh, and the Federals are in agreement. And that he's not going anywhere. And it just, it gets to be such a mess. And it really, it was anytime that I find narratives of historical figures behaving badly, it always brings me an enormous amount of solace when I watch contemporary figures behaving badly, because I'm mm -hmm. reminded that this is nothing new. Uh, in fact, this has been going on since time immemorial. And the only thing that erases it is uh, uh, <laughs> historical and mytholo mythologies that retell um, our, our history in Halcyon Light that, uh, that erases the, uh, the negative standpoints. 
of our of our past but i find our humanness our human foibles of our past you know leaders and thinkers etc to be incredibly incredibly reassuring because all of those people in the past were <laughs> no no more or less screwed up than we are today and yet somehow inexplicably here we are anyway forging ahead and tells me that 100 100 years from now we might still have a history exactly i mean and that and that that is very true i mean there's always been uh worse moments and better moments than any other time and um it's frustrating sometimes going through those kind of times just as obviously it was frustrating for Reynolds and Price who decided to make it very public but yes. um, um so it it is nothing new and and this too shall pass whatever whatever situation it may be uh but I, I agree with you there but it also those events also uh, tell why there's such an influence of the Ozarks in Texas uh, because there was such a presence and a settling of people, refugees. And so there was a large area around Marshall in particular, but other places as well that really identified as Missourians and also some from Arkansas as well. It did, they did. And, you know, I think that they're, you know, it, you, it's difficult to really get into the minds of the, of the settlers slash immigrants slash refugees, um, you know, a combination of everyone going into this, but certainly early on, there had to be, you know, these mixed feelings of hope for return when, mm -hmm. uh, when, when the, uh, when Missouri, and particularly in, in terms of Southwest Missouri, when Missouri becomes clearly a, a union state, and then is because of the, the natural resources discovered there or already known about there that began to be uh, mined in particular, as well as as uh, lumber harvesting, et cetera, bringing in, <clears throat> and then the the um, Homestead Act, particularly around 1874, bringing in so many Yankees, quite frankly, into into the the state that uh, I, you have to imagine that a lot of the the uh, Missourians living in in Texas their dream of or leave their plan to return home when things were better died and they they chose to remain that's true or head on west uh, other to other points um and so you know those arts went with them and now we might switch over switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the the lore Yes. And cryptids that seem to have uh, hidden out in the wagon trains going south. 100%. I do really briefly just want to share one stanza sure. from, from, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not going to sing it because I have no idea what the melody is. The Shelby's Meal and Waiting for the Federals. Uh, I just loved it. And just because it, <laughs> again, it, it, Hmm, it just is. The Union folks away up north were one time much afraid about something coming from the south. They said it was a raid. Now, I will tell you what it was, if you will just keep cool. It had long ears and a long slick tail. It was called Joe Shelby's Mule. Shout, boys, make a noise. The Yankees are afraid that something's up and hell's to pay when Shelby's on a raid. <laughs> I do think that pretty well sums things up and, and, and how they felt about, about Shelby. Uh, I and agree. Why they were kind of relieved that he went to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so just, it's still, it's still amazing to me. And I love it. The fact that 
Shelby comes back from Mexico, has never surrendered, and ends up getting hired as a U.S. Marshal. Yes, and um, and 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 a lot of other things in between, um, and um, yes. that um, it it's you know it said it said a lot for the respect that people on both sides had for him. Um, and, um, you know, uh, there were statements of people who fought against him that, you know, were very glowing that, you know, he, he was the best officer that they had seen in the field or cavalry, et cetera. So um, that's hard to, um, to argue with. In fact, um, uh, Dennis Cecil, who was in Jenison's Calvary, who faced uh, Shelby on Price's, during Price's raid, wrote that it is needless to comment upon the merits or demerits of, of great chieftains, but the fact is patent that Joe Shelby was the best general that ever drew sword on Missouri soil. I, I absolutely love that quote. Yeah. On, it resonates on so many levels. Really briefly, I do have to check on my puppy. Okay. Um, but there is a moment, we've talked about this, a moment when an elderly Joe Shelby is on a train. Well, not actually not that elderly. It's just a, a couple of years after he gets back. It's okay. in the late 1860s. But I, yeah, I can tell the story. Please do. Um, Please do. I love that story. Basically... Um, there had been bonds issued by Cass County uh, in Cass County's um, up towards Kansas City for um, a railroad to come through. And when the war happened, the bonds were worthless. And of course, the work didn't get done. The, the railroad was not built. So after the war, several county officials, including one of the county judges, uh, conspired um, with attorneys that worked for the railroad who had issued the bonds to begin with. Um, and basically, the judge entered an illegal order saying the bonds were valid again, basically, and increased their value, um, stating that basically they could be paid out as soon as they were picked up from the office of the railroad. Um, and they had offices in Kansas City and St. Louis. During this time period, uh, Joe Shelby, uh, after the war and um, a business partner were um, um, they were doing contracts with the railroad, the same railroad, but were not involved in this this bond uh, scheme uh, that uh, the county officials were in. So the county officials, they go seize the bonds and word gets out and the people who had had bought the bonds before the war realized that they were about to get screwed over. So um, it comes to light and uh, they bring charges against the, the county officials and they end up moving the trial to Gallatin. It's funny, we keep having trials at Gallatin, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and so during the trial, they would basically put everyone on the train from Cass County and, and they go over there and have court. And so one, one day, um, a mob decided they'd had enough. They, they were just, they, they were, they're going to drag them off the train and and end it all. Um, and it happened that Joe Shelby and his business partner were on the train 
but not involved in that or associated with that at all. So Mob stops the train and they drag the county officials that are defendants in this case off. They end up killing some of them and they're going through the train and someone yells that Joe Shelby's um, on it and the, the mob start, starts going on, you know, to, to haul him out, to bring him out, that they're going to kill Joe Shelby. Um, and the story goes that they come to the train car and um, uh, his business partner had gotten up and was, you know, frightened. But Shelby just sat in his chair and he happened to be wearing his Navy Colts, which she wore during the war. Um, but he just sat there and um, um, they demanded he come out. And he said, if you want me, come and get me. <laughs> and before it was all, before it was over with, they faltered and turned around and left. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like a fictional scene from a Western. It really does, but but uh, there are various accounts that that's, that's what happens, so. Absolutely. Uh, and it is rationally within keeping in Shelby's personality and skill set. It is. It is that, uh, and the witnesses said basically just the tenor of his voice and glare of his eye was enough to uh, make them blink and falter. Mm. You you think about everything that he'd faced down in the years prior. The, that I don't mob. think that. I don't think they wanted him to pull his pistols. I don't think they did either. And, uh, <laughs> I'll be thinking about that the next time I'm standing in Newtonia. <laughs> yes, <laughs> me too. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. so folklore. Yes. Um, we probably should get it. Just let, let's just get it out there, you know, so, sort of you know, to your consternation, probably yes. one, one of the uh, pop, most popular Ozarks creatures currently seemingly made, it, made its way to Texas. The Ozark Howler. Yes. <laughs> uh, Josh loves the Ozark Howler. Um, <laughs> oh, not really. Um, I do find I do find it interesting uh, uh, cryptid or folkloric creature and some mm, some of our list really falls into the category of folkloric creature some mm -hmm. more into the category of cryptid it is a a process to really sort those out but I do think it's a testament to the shared culture between of Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas that the Ozark Howler is actually included in these uh, lists of uh, fearsome beasts in, in Texas. And I do appreciate the fact that it, it actually has a couple of new names in mm -hmm. uh, in texas including but not limited to the black howler uh the nightshade bear and the devil cat and for those who you know, are wondering what it is that we're talking about it's a creature to be that's roughly the size of a bear believed to have large horns and glowing red eyes and is essentially feline yes and these days spends its time on billboards yes yes it is the howler is a potent marketing message in southern missouri it is and <laughs> and it and it really 
has exploded um, with the internet in the last oh, 15 years. It has. And one of the things I actually appreciate about the uh, this particular reference of our Texan Ozark Howler mm -hmm. is that its description is a little more specific. Yeah. And that is one of the things that the, the internet has, has done is broaden the description of the howler to include so many possibilities that it, it's very difficult to tell what is and isn't a howler. I think that's one of the things that makes it such a potent uh, spooky symbol in, on cyberspace because it's a, it's a situation where Oh, it's it could be this, it could be that. It goes bump in the night, uh, but it isn't mm, hierarchically structured within any one thing. So it can be whatever the teller wants it to be. In other words, it's hard to pick out in a lineup. It's very hard to pick out the lineup. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're reasonably sure it is not related to a snail. <laughs> Everything else is up for grabs, but uh, there is a, an odd um, possible connection with uh, with Daniel Boone in Missouri, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, having crossed paths with the Howler or something like the Howler. But what we do know is that large cats of unknown color or indeterminate color uh, are reported throughout all four of these states. Yes. Now, an interesting thing with with the the uh, the Daniel Boone account is I've actually I, I've I've read it before that it was, um, and I, I'm thinking it's probably the same account that uh, most people took that it was a uh, a wild man or a, a bigfoot that he encountered. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably more realistic, actually. And I realize that I just said Daniel Boone encountering a Bigfoot is more realistic than the Ozark Howler. <laughs> but that's still a fair statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, and <laughs> fortunately, in this case, one that appears to be backed up by journal entries. Yeah. Well, and now, 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 here's the thing too: is that there, there is. Um, there, there is a, a lot of um, debate about the journal entries mm. as well. Um, well. It wouldn't be a fun cryptid lead if there wasn't a lot of questions. Right. They, uh, um, and then um, flip over, um, uh, since we're talking about Texas, that um, there is an account, a supposed account of Davy Crockett encountering a um, a wild man or, or Bigfoot creature, or it could have been a howler too, um, somewhere near Shreveport, which of course is not very far. No, okay. <clears throat> no. And it's speaking of Bigfoot, and of course Bigfoot is on our list. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are a lot of Bigfoot sightings that are reported in Texas, mm -hmm. but an interesting sort of point of conflation, a point of, of intersection is Texarkana and Boggy Creek. Yes, and in that in that whole general uh, river system and sandy swamps um, covers a, a large area that straddles Arkansas and Texas. So. And, and certainly is one of the more infamous uh, Bigfoot accounts. And to be honest, uh, is similar to accounts that you get in the rest of those arts as well. They are, they are. And, <clears throat> you know, I think that the the Bigfoot mystique and we'll you know we talk about Texas obviously with with you know especially with Boggy Creek and its direct ties it's part of a watershed that includes that that chunk of state 
there are, on one hand, there, there are so many uh, modern reasons, um, societal population, uh, modern infrastructure, everyone having a cell phone, everyone you know having all of this access that leads a lot of people. And there's times that my brain can go there too, leads a lot of people to the point of saying, this is, uh, this is folklore, it is hoax, it is a joke, it is fiction, uh, Bigfoot is fiction. And that sounds great all the way up until some of these reports occur. That's true. And in many cases, in so many cases, in many of our documented cases, the reports are coming from individuals there. These are not people out there trying to do a documentary. They're not people out there, um, you know, attempting to hoax the town. Mm -hmm. uh, it's none of that. These are individuals that were doing things like checking on their livestock, driving down a farm road, hunting, fishing, um, going to, you know, into remote areas because maybe they had property there, et cetera. The individuals whose minds were not remotely, I'm going to encounter a Bigfoot and tell my family and friends. And yet they come back with these experiences that are very specific and they are consistent in so many cases, consistent in terms of experience. And it, it is more than enough anecdotal evidence to really lead us to ask, you know, what is going on here? It is more than just people making things up. Exactly, and, and, it, and it goes back a long time. I mean, really in the Ozarks, uh, dates to the early 1800s, shortly after the New Madrid uh, earthquakes. And the accounts are of wild men, um, and then later Bigfoot creatures, basically coming out of that area, heading south through Arkansas, which of course, if you go south enough and west, you're going to end up in Folk, in Tetsarkana, in Texas. So, you know, it's, it's not surprising that there's similarities of accounts from the Ozarks all the way down uh, into Texas. So, uh, you know, and it's been going on for a very long time that we can't ignore. Yeah. And it, it is a... <clears throat> You know, again, there there's so many, <clears throat> pardon me, so many logistical questions involved in this. That said, you really don't have to go hunting for an animal of any kind in the forest for very long to realize it's not easy to find things out there. Very, very true. Very, very true. Um, and just, just as a counterpoint of something that's a, a little different, but straddles sort of the paranormal and cryptid or misplaced animal or known animal, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the ghost horse. I love the Texas ghost horse. <laughs> I, I I do too. And, and, and actually, uh, there, there are, there are, stories of it that go north through you know Oklahoma and on up into the plains and on out west but a real interesting aspect of this story is it really starts with you know you know with the Ozarks in the first major telling of it and basically um, the ghost horse or the white steed of the prairies or the, um, or the ghost horse of the plains, the, the wind drinker goes by various names, but basically is a Mustang that almost appears ghost-like because it, it almost isn't running. It's almost just gliding. Um, 
in the same way that um, people describe an apparition as floating instead of walking, pretty much. Yes. yes. And, and, and it's oh, it's a white horse. It's a white stallion. It's a white horse. White stallion. And um, pretty early, people started trying to track this thing. And um, you, you later on, you have, uh, you know, expeditions out of Texas, you know, going up into Oklahoma in the 1870s and 80s looking for it. But I find it interesting that the first real telling of it really comes out of um, the Ozarks um, in um, a fella out of um, Appalachia named Kentuck who pairs up with an Arkansas gambler, Jake, <laughs> before the Civil War. So this is very early. It and is. they go, they go looking for it through Texas and they end up going through Texas into New Mexico and and tracking it and basically it's a cautionary tale because it almost reminds me of of um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade a bit you know because the greed of, of chasing it to your own demise, um, that basically uh, the Arkansas gambler becomes so obsessed to follow him that he races his own horse over the edge of a canyon, even though Kentuck is trying to tell him to stop. Yes, uh, and as is, is appropriate in terms of lore, Jake, completely obsessed and wearing the look of a madman, yells back, I told you I'm going to follow him till the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, um, actually, the Lord, it, 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 it is a little reminiscent of the great hunt. It is. I, I was noticing that. Um, I wonder if it, if it did inform ghost riders in the sky in that regard and there was and of course we understand this is a this is a bit of folklore this is a mm -hmm. story that is told around the fire but there was a, a a moment in the in the story that actually two in terms of this particular narrative um, Jake recounting this, um, his horse began to tire. The, the, the ghost horse moved like a white shadow and the harder we rode, the more shadowy he looked. Of course, they're, they're chasing him in the night mm -hmm. uh, under, under a full moon. And <clears throat> that Jake begins to experience, quote, an increasing sense of foreboding. And then a little bit later, that it's really it it <clears throat> the the quote um, it didn't seem like this world uh, riding on and on out there in the middle of nowhere, not even a coyote breaking the silence. It didn't seem like this world. Yeah. I mean, there, this 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 movement into um, otherworldly threshold space. Yeah, I mean, it, it just it it really, to me, just speaks of you know settlers coming over through Appalachia through the Ozarks and retelling the Great Hunt almost in the landscape of this area in Texas and then Oklahoma and New Mexico. I, it, it strikes that me that way as well. Uh, something that's within this particular narrative 
mentioning that the wild Mustang re remains a symbol of the Old West and the idea that these horses represent freedom and liberty endures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, a unique conflation of a wide variety of motifs that, as, as you mentioned, uh, the old world, uh, the old European legends of the wild hunt of Odin, uh, these ghostly horses uh, in the night. <clears throat> we fast forwarding perhaps a bit more from our perspective, the, the fact that the Mustang represents freedom freedom of the open plains of the open road, freedom of the American dream, that sort of thing. So it captures our imagination there. But then encapsulated within the story is really even this idea of a, of a fae, a fae horse, uh, and the idea that um, the First Nation peoples who are involved in the story initially called to help hunt down this horse, when they are within the proximity based on their own indigenous stories that there is an understanding that this is an otherworldly being. And if you know what you're doing, you know not to cross that threshold space. Exactly. And yeah, so the earlier version is 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 the Ozark version almost with Arkansas, Kentucky, and then the later version. Uh, of the Texans, they, they're also working with El Vaqueros and everything. And so basically you have uh, the legends of Mexico and Central America uh, overlapping with Native Americans and they all see the ghost horse the same way. Yes, yes. With the exception of the Arkansas Gambler. Yes. <laughs> who was bound and determined to catch that damn horse because he's convinced it actually is just a horse. Yeah. <laughs> Which again is uh, kind of reminiscent of some of the various motifs of the gambler in 19th century lore too. Yes. And, and really that uh, um, personal obsession that winning at all cost and, yes. and cursing the fates. Yes. And, and that's exactly what happens in the story. But yeah, I, I do find that very interesting. So something that typically would be viewed as such a Texas and further West story as its first incarnation basically with those arts. Yes. With that, with that folkloric connection, and uh, and of course, Kentuck and Jake. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, what do you want to talk about next? Oh, I was a little fascinated by the beast of bears, described as a terrifying cryptid found lurking around the swamps and woodlands of southern Texas said to be an enormous brown bear with lots of scars and missing fur. Um, most people say the beast of bears has a strong and hideous odor that smells like alcohol and putrid eggs. But then we take the folklore a, straight out of left field. Uh, Inuit legend speaks of a massive bear with gills that is capable of stalking its prey underwater, much like a crocodile. Now that would be frightening. <laughs> yes. Not something that you want to find. And it now fortunately for us here in the Ozarks, the our bear population is a, you know reestablishing the, the black mm -hmm. bear population. And while it is potentially unsettling to find a um, mature black bear roosting in your bird feeder. And, and that does happen, especially around here. And in yeah. association with the Mark Twain National Forest it's around here, Chadwick, et cetera, that we don't have a lot of spooky lore about bears because black bears are not grizzly bears. Right. 
That's true. That, that I mean, that that is true. Other, other than, you know, the closest would be the howler, you know. Right, right. I, I still think that that uh, mm, the the idea of a of a of a half bear half crocodile hunting you in the swamp. Yeah, that's that's enough to get anyone's attention. <laughs> and I, I we we would be amiss not to talk about the goat man. That's true. That's true. Uh, before we get to the goat man, though, uh, I think yeah. going from the bears to the prairie devils, I find interesting. I love the lore associated with the prairie devils and this was actually this was a new one for me I, I was not anticipating that the prairie devils also called the river dinos the mini rexes of the water lizards are a form of reptilian cryptid sighted all throughout texas georgia and kentucky and if we're dealing with texas georgia and kentucky we surely have to be dealing at least with arkansas as well all sightings of these graceful lizards have been reported near water, hence the name. Um, like most other Texas cryptids, prairie devils are considered a hoax by most people, but the people that have seen them say they're only about three feet long and resemble miniature brown bipedal dinosaurs. Local experts doubt that any known species of lizard would be capable of surviving the harsh winters of the area, adding to the mystery. Now, What what dinosaur uh, creature do we have in those arts? Uh, besides the Gowrow? Yeah. <laughs> There's one living at the bottom of Marble Cave, you know. Exactly. <laughs> With uh, luminous eyes the size of dinner plates and jaws that can break an iron bar in half. Actually, the prairie devils kind of remind me of a a combination of the Galrau and the White River Monster. <laughs> <laughs> not, not too shabby. I this one, this one is like I said, is new to me. Um, and it really moves into that that instant territory, that instant cryptid territory that. Our logic says this couldn't happen. Right. Our logic says these things aren't there. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Y'all are making stuff up. But I guarantee you, if you were at the water's edge and suddenly you saw one or more of these, you would be asking yourself the same question. What, am I, what on earth am I seeing? This doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that I should be seeing what I'm seeing. And yet, I just saw what I just saw. Now, what do I do with that information? And while I've not talked to someone with an anecdotal report specifically on prairie devils, that is the process that so many people that we've talked to, whether it's dealing with um, Bigfoot, or goat man, um, the little people, uh, mm -hmm. the Ewa, um, flying saucers and or alien uh, reports, or something as simple as paranormal and ghost activity. Right. What everyone who's experienced these things typically responds with. I know I shouldn't be seeing what I'm seeing, but I know that I saw it. That's true. That's true. But and I and I'm not real familiar with prairie devils either. But as I was researching this and reading about them, I just kept thinking, you know, you have all these people coming from the Ozarks with tales of, say, the Galrau and the yes. river monsters, mm -hmm. and it seems to perhaps be informed. Uh, in the description of these prairie devils, very much so the same terminology as these Ozark creatures. I do think there's a potential for, for crossover in that regard. And I think it's fascinating because it's, 
it's it's evocative of so many questions and questions that are directly related to Ozarks and Southern lore. Mm-hmm. I I agree with you there. So goat man. <laughs> Goatman and then um, La Llorona, um, since I did bring up ghosts, but Goatman. Now, there, there's various aspects. The, this particular, the Texas Goatman, a humanoid Krypton believed to roam about the state. Some people say that it is relative to the Chupacabra, and others believe that it to be the last descendant of the satyrs from ancient Greece. Origins aside, most people agree that the Goatman is over seven feet tall and has long horns and sharp claws. Um, Unlike most of the other Texas cryptids on the list, the Goatman is known to show extreme violence toward humans. And that is interesting. And there's a Goatman Hollow mm-hmm. not far from Devil's Promenade. All right. And, uh, and not far from Yule, not far from, from Joplin. Mm-mm. It's particularly fascinating to me um i i have a tendency to associate the goat man with mm, sacred tribal lands Mm -hmm. and ancestral conjuring locations i think that's fair there there are a couple of goat man legends around the country that would be that really fall into that but that's true, and in, in, in the Goatman Holler that's not far from me, the legend is more about a Sasquatch kind of creature with uh, ram horns. Yes. One thing that crossed my mind just, just now is it's, it's not uncommon in certain locations. Uh, Devil's Promenade location is mm-hmm. one of them that you tend to have a lot of odd stuff yeah and and of course and I'm, I'm going to say it buckle up uh, we we appear to have anecdotal concentrations of bigfoot sighting bigfoot experiences in relationship to ufo sightings um there i said it i'll be i'll be yeah anyway i'll stop there but <laughs> Coming back to the sacred sites, there's one way that that folks tend to um, land, which is that the 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 cryptid is a result of the conjuring. Mm-hmm. Um, but utilizing actually one of your theories, which I really uh, have a lot of respect for, is what if the goat man, goat man, or the Bigfoot because of their potentially the implied much greater sensitivity to the world around them, to vibrations around them, would they not be attracted to or interested in locations that resonate with a conjuring? I think that's, I think that's potentially a valid idea i mean i hadn't really thought of it that way but you know um i hadn't until tonight but it just you know know, we 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 recognize the fact that if bigfoot for example is real Mm -hmm. uh and i believe that they are um that they these are uh physical beings Mm -hmm. that um whose perception extends beyond ours in, and I think that is a, a very consistent um, uh, impression by a lot of witnesses, yes. And that, hmm, <clears throat> just that, you know, the, the, the aspects of legitimate conjurings leave a, an energetic mark on the, on the geographical location that 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 human beings typically typically uh are not aware of in just their their everyday senses 
that's true. Uh, although I think it's kind of akin to a lot of sacred sites around the world that often people will feel that there's certain energy there, even if they aren't recognizing it, quote, as sacred space or ritual space. Uh, yeah. But they seem to be cognizant that there's something different there. So I think it's conceivable that it's something along the same lines. And uh, and on a on a historical note, it is one of the one of the reasons that uh, a lot of early European um, church sites were built over or within immediate proximity of sacred spaces and sacred wells, particularly in Britain. Yeah. Which theoretically, I just now have an image in my head of an American Bigfoot standing outside an abbey somewhere in Britain. <laughs> Some vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Got his passport stamped. That uh, the <laughs> fun days at the TSA. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask him where he keeps his carry-on luggage. I'm not asking. The uh, the the association with satyrs, I think, is really interesting in terms of goat man. That's not something that we've discussed in terms of uh, you know if our your experience with goat man holler and uh, the goat man war within the the Oklahoma Ozarks and, and Missouri right. Ozarks is typically associated with is not associated with Greco Roman war. No, um, it it is associated with the Cherokee and the Quapaw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the satyr motif, you know, I find interesting. It it, se it seems sort of a odd place to land in Texas for me, but we're <laughs> <laughs> a little it's, unexpected. Um, but I do think that there's interesting layers of mm, cultural influence mm -hmm. uh, one of course is the, the the native american lore that is associated with uh the the goat man stories mm -hmm. um, but you know it's not it doesn't take an enormous amount of conjecture to imagine that someone encounters the goat man or encounters the stories of the goat man as described as half man half goat and then something that of course we're relatively familiar through pop culture with greco roman um mythology and and school books and so on and so forth but something that might come as a surprise is that so many of for example mid 19th century um frontier settlers and pioneers not only were extraordinarily literate they were extremely well read in uh in the classics very true that's that's true so that 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 may be in part where that comes from. Otherwise, it, it's otherwise not, I'm really not sure how a satyr just pops <laughs> up in Texas. But oh, uh, one um, <laughs> one one story that I I really want your thoughts on, and a huge shout out actually to. Uh, supernatural and Sam and Dean for introducing me to this bit of lore and I think season one but La Llorona the yeah. uh, the the weeping woman presented mm -hmm. as a banshee type apparition of a woman dressed in white often found by lakes and rivers sometimes at crossroads like that's not a hoodoo uh, reference right there crying into the night for her lost children whom she killed mm -hmm. uh Mexican folklore tale goes back hundreds of years and is commonly told in areas like the Rio Grande Valley. And there's even a, a 2019 film as mm -hmm. well. So, oh, with Linda Cardellini from uh, Scooby Doo. So, uh, we'll circle there. But, uh, but they're, they're very similar stories to, um, to her 
in the Ozarks, um, a couple around uh, Oklahoma uh, bodies of water that are in the Ozarks, um, as well as in um, a couple of stories uh, around the lakes in Missouri and Northwest Arkansas of, uh, you know, this weeping, crying woman being found um, and often associated with, uh, you know, a tragedy where children were killed. And there's the, the sort of central Missouri Ozark story of the, the woman who walks the ridges. Yes, yes. And I think, I, I think there's definitely similarity um, with the stories this set uh, in ridges uh, along the ridges instead of a body of water but um, and uh, she often is uh, observed almost like a banshee yes so, so what do you what do you make of this lore? I mean, realistically, so much that's currently surrounding La Llorona is almost almost in the in the category of urban legend. A lot of it is, and and I think there's there's a particularly um, popular version of it. I think around San Antonio, if I remember right. Interesting. And, um, but um, I think that personally, I, I think that you tend to have these, these types of apparitions are, are more common because of the tragedy associated. Uh, mm -hmm. You have someone grieving for children or looking for children, um, often um, warning other people to stay away from a dangerous area, you know, the, the water or whatever. Um, and it's very understandable if someone went through this, that they would be, that their energy would be tied to it. So, um, I think it's a type of haunting that makes sense. And I think it then because you hear these tales and uh, often witnesses will talk about it having an impact on them, an emotional impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it then turns around and becomes easy for uh urban legend to grow up and sort of the more sensational versions of it, you know, and then displayed through movies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's because it's a universal tragedy that everyone can associate with. I think, that, I think that is very fair. Of course, it it is a, an interesting sort of bridge. Uh, you take, for example, um, not a mother, but the burning bride associated with Fayetteville, Arkansas. You go to the, the, the woman who walks the ridges, which is associated with the Rolla area, then to, for example, um, more modern um, Oklahoma and also Texas, Crybaby Bridge, in which right. uh, um, you know, an automobile accident claims the life of a mother and child. And the, and the mother's ghost is seen on the bridge or in association with the bridge and the water. Down mm -hmm. to La Llorona, um, where the woman has murdered the children, but is now grieving. Her ghost is now grieving. Presumably, um, her death is also associated somehow with this tragedy. Right. And, you know, and it, it would make sense why that kind of lore would resonate whether it's, uh, I mean, because there's versions of this in, in Mexico and in throughout Latin America, um, as well as it almost being, you know, your archetypal haunting on the moors in Great Britain. I mean, 
it resonates pretty much in any culture, I think. It does. <laughs> and there's, you know, the, the, the Appalachian story, which is mm, a bit different, but, you know, it's, it's encapsulated by um, the, uh, the bluegrass slash uh, folk song, Bringing Mary Home. Mm -hmm. uh, a car accident has claimed the life of a young girl. And on the, the anniversary of her death, a driver will see the girl at the, along the roadside at the point of the accident. Mm -hmm. um, the, the apparition is so human uh, that he stops thinking that she's a young girl who needs help, uh, helps her actually physical, helps her into the car. Mm -hmm. uh, she interacts enough to get you know give him directions to drive to a specific homestead and then when he pulls up she's gone right and there's a, a, a fairly famous uh version of that in chicago with mary um her name is mary and and people will pick her up and take her home <laughs> and she usually she wants to be let out the cemetery at, at, and i'm don't remember the particular cemetery. It's not Bachelors Grove, but it's another one. And, uh, you know, and then she just dis disappears as she's getting out of the car kind of thing. And they tell somebody and realize, you know, it's it's the ghost of this girl who died in a, in a car wreck, you know, back in the early 1900s. And, and uh, she's buried in this cemetery. Mm -hmm. And she's hitching a ride back home yeah every you know every time and and home is the graveyard yeah what do you do jumping over into paranormal we have one of the things that we we often do is dispel the myth that graveyards are innately haunted right um but sometimes there is this lore associated with the graveyard as being the home, the new home, the new residence of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I think that can, that can happen. Um, I just don't think it's as common as, as people assume. Mm -hmm. um, I think people tend to think if they go to a particularly an old cemetery that ghosts are just going to be standing around waiting to chit chat, you know, um but um there there do there does seem to be a handful of these tales where the ghost goes back to their grave why yeah. i don't know um and um and again maybe it's something else that somehow they're attached to there rather than just the fact that it's their grave i don't know um right. but the one with mary is the one that uh, i'm the most familiar with it. she always you know asks to be let out at the at the graveyard <laughs> and uh, um, but uh, and who knows you know if it gets embellished or not but um there certainly are cemeteries that are haunted. Yes. I just find more of them not than are. <laughs> right. Or not nearly as haunted as their reputation suggests. Very true. <laughs> Very true. And, and, you know, just for the record, I hope I'm not haunting the graveyard, so. Yeah, as, as, as far as, uh, you know, overall, Oh, locations to haunt. I mean, the graveyards are peaceful enough, oftentimes quite beautiful, probably not as exciting as, or interesting as a lot of other locations. That would be my thought. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that brings up just an interesting thing. Sometimes um, paranormal uh, energy mm -hmm. is attracted to activity is attracted to energy, is attracted to sort of um, environments that have a lot of hustle and bustle related to them. Other That's times, 
you you have you seem to have a situation where if there's a lot of people around the the spiritual activity the spirit activity recedes and goes and hides moves to areas that are empty and vacant and 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 stays in those areas i think it's almost the the person you know so to speak the personality of the ghost um and sometimes you have both of those things happen at the same location you know where you have some some presence that is very interested in the goings on and if there's people around and go you know watch and everything and then at the same time you have presence that tends to wherever people are they go somewhere else and i think that's the area that's empty and it will it will vary you know it, it makes sense that activity will vary just depending on the on the person very true i think that I think that has a lot to do with it. I really, I really do. Um, but, and I think even some that sometimes where activity tends to kind of recede to an area that's quieter. If you have something going on that's completely out of the ordinary, that doesn't usually happen there, um, it can bring it, bring out that activity of that curiosity of what's going on. Yes. And what I think is, is fascinating to me, particularly if you're doing investigations or you know, researching, recording anecdotal data about a location, that you might have the original location that is much older mm -hmm. and, and is associated that where the, the actual incidences that could be associated with the hauntings took place. Right. But if that area sees a lot of activity, of physical activity of people coming and going and that sort of thing that the associated activity could actually move to an area that is quieter even if that area is newer or is not associated with the haunting that's i mean that's true and it, it again it goes to the fact that you know it's it's not trapped of you know four walls no and of course we can wander around into different locations uh, other things can as well exactly and and we can on the other side as well <laughs> the what do you think we have um coming down to the, the um lechusa mm -hmm. there's uh harpy like witch ghost soldier sold as satan shows up as an owl with a woman's face um that's my summation of lechusa <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely some uh, some Babylonian echoes of Lilith and the night owl screeching in the desert, uh, mm -hmm. hunting for souls. What? Yeah, but, just, no. go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, but the the shape shifting witch as a as a dark omen has a lot of tie ins with a lot of different things. It does, and 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 it, it reminds me a lot of the Cherokee uh, lore of witchcraft. But just overall, it reminds me a lot of uh, Dear Woman um, legends, mm. uh, because it, although this is um, having a, a bird human body um, with the woman's face, whereas often with a Dear Woman. Um, she's seen as a as a beautiful woman, um, but um, if you look at her directly and look down, you will see the deer legs. Um, and because uh, at least in this part of the country, deer woman legends tend to be centered around places where a woman was murdered particularly by her husband or lover. Right. Now, <clears throat> is the idea, here's a question, and this is, even as I'm getting ready to formulate this question, I'm, my, my brain is categorizing what I know in terms of lore of this nature, and the answer is going to be yes. Um, is it this or is it that? Is it, for example, is is dear woman the physical manifestation the murdered ghost uh of the woman who was who was so clearly 
wronged and murdered by the, the man who took advantage of her? Or did the murder inadvertently create a conjuring that has brought dear woman into this location? Um, I, 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 I tend to lean more towards the second, actually, that, that dear woman tends to be drawn to these situations in these places and almost as a, a an avenging spirit for the victim um in in a lot of the legends then she um will either entice the the uh, perpetrator or other um men who have the same predilections to their demise. Right. <clears throat> and it is, uh, on one level, it is a cautionary tale, um, a, a recommendation not to be a horrible person. That's, that's pretty basic. But the, the Dear Woman lore has a lot of individuals reporting having seen her. Yes. Yes, um, um, and um, that um, that she can appear differently depending on how you're you're if you're looking at her face or if you're looking down at her feet. Um, but yeah, there are there are a lot of accounts of actually seeing her. Um, although Lachosa, I I assume that there probably are as well in that part of the country right. that something that is implied with Lechusa is that she's not a cautionary tale that this is an evil figure right right uh, that that is that is the difference is that um that she is has used basically witchcraft for evil purposes and as you've noted uh, already, but the Cherokee lore surrounding black magic very strongly resembles the information that we currently have in front of us about Lechusa. It, it, it does. I mean, and, 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 and again, there are accounts of Lechusa actually being the spirit of a, of a murdered woman, that she's not a witch, it's one or the other. So there are different versions of it. So um, if it's a spirit of a murdered woman appearing this way, that's a little closer to dear woman. It is, it so, is. If it is, if it is a, if it is a witch, mm -hmm. then we're really dealing more with the Cherokee black magic motif. Right. Um, and okay. something, this is just referencing our, our Cherokee black magic episode, but something I find really fascinating about Cherokee black witchcraft or black magic and witchcraft is that the practitioners are, at least in terms of tradition, this is tradition in the 19th century and in some rural areas of Eastern Oklahoma coming into the 20th century that the practitioners or the suspected practitioners were not even considered to be human. Right, um, very, very much so. It, it's more akin to some of the current uh, incarnations of lore on skinwalkers and wendigo etc yes although flight is usually involved right that's true <laughs> as if everything else wasn't terrifying enough yes they can fly um but what, then yeah. but, uh well Luchusa appears in the form of an owl, yes. which I would assume would have flight. Absolutely, absolutely. Which I think is, um, as as opposed, I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, negating the lichus. I was in referencing the uh, Wendigo or the Skinwalker. Oh yeah, but I was just saying it's an interesting parallel. A very interesting parallel. I uh, I find it terrifying, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is the point. Um, and speaking of terrifying, speaking of terrifying, El Kukoi, 
um, or El Coco, which, or Coco, or Cam Camucho, um, a small humanoid with glowing red eyes that hides the closets that are under the beds. Like, that's not freaking terrifying. <laughs> um, the boogeyman, basically. Images, images of Silent Hill creeping into my subconscious. But there are interesting accounts of mm, supernatural entities child that, that appear almost childlike, which honestly is way creepier than the giant boogeyman, you know, the huge purple monster that you think is, is hiding somewhere. The, the idea of these, whether it's the black-eyed children or um the kukoi um or 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 quite honestly the little people or an apparition of children it can be very unsettling it, it very much uh can be um um i do find it interesting that um some of the literature indicates that um you know sort of you know smoothing it over to and this is all shadow men um, I'm not sure I would go quite that far, but I, I wouldn't either. It's this one, this one is, is difficult because obviously on, on one level it's, uh, be good or else, mm -hmm. but as with most, um, supernatural, paranormal, uh, or crypto zoological phenomena, and I wouldn't. I would not classify um, the Kukoi as a as a cryptid. No. Uh, we're we're moving into paranormal territory here. Yes. Yeah. And 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 I think that sort of the analogy of a shadow man is not necessarily unfair as far as portraying it in that sense. But I think that some of these kinds of tales are where we have gotten to the point of saying that all shadow men are evil and inhuman right. etc which i don't i don't i don't agree with based on my own experience agree agree and <clears throat> while we're on the topic and this might be actually more applicable in terms of our references to what um is that your experiences, your paranormal experiences in association with child spirits are, are typically not only benign, uh, but, but generally positive. Yes. Um, I mean, most, most of the time, they're very playful, um, uh, not manipulative, even, even um, any that I've dealt with that I wouldn't characterize as playful, but perhaps were uh, appeared, you know, sad or, you know, law, you know, sort of looking for something uh, and not in a playful mood, were not manipulative or um, aggressive in any way. Which is, it should come as a relief to individuals who might be concerned uh, yeah. uh, about that. There's, no, I think that there's there's a a variety of concerns that are associated with the occurrence of child spirits. Mm -hmm. I think I think people are just uncomfortable with the idea of a dead child, um, and in part, I think it affects our sensibilities more now than it did, say, 150 or 200 years ago, because yes. we, don't, we don't lose as many children as we used to. So it, for a lot of people, they have never mourned in that, in that way. Um, and so it the really idea is. of a child dying is so um, or out of their experience that it's terrifying. And and I think the the big takeaway on that, in terms of being in uh, what it, what is 
in essence, a, a highly civilized, highly prosperous country with effective medical care is that yeah. child mortality has gone down so drastically in the last hundred years. It, it really has. And so um, I think that's why uh, a spirit that is a child or childlike is so unsettling. Now, you had a really, and I, I really love the story, you had an interesting experience with what you feel strongly was a child apparition in Springfield. Oh, yes. Um, actually, at the Shrine Mosque, yes. Um, um, in an investigation that I uh, actually 10 years ago, um, and um, we were doing an investigation. Uh, we were in the upper uh, catwalks and um, uh, I had walked away from um, the other couple of investigators that I was with. I would walked about 20 feet away and I heard footsteps behind me. At first I thought it was one of them but it sounded very childlike and um, turned and just got a quick image before it dissipated of a small boy. And um, uh, I, I asked the question, what's your name? And just disembodied her the, the word Tommy. Mm. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. And, but I do think that there's the 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 discomfort on that is just imagining. Um, imagining the distress and tragedy. Yes. And in the idea of a life cut short um, before yeah. it's time, it's, um, and, and I think for for better or for worse, we oftentimes project additional things the idea that the 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 spirit of the child is lost the spirit of the child is is upset um mm -hmm. those types of things the thing that things that we would associate with a child that had wasn't able to go home and and, and, I, and I think that people often do that not only with child spirits but spirits in general um they're more distressed not by, you know, by having experience with them so much as the idea that it doesn't fit in the box of they're supposed to go somewhere else and there must be something wrong. Yes. And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the, the apparitions are in distress. We have to yeah. take that into account across the board. Uh -huh. Occasionally but oftentimes not oftentimes that and it you know indicated that and that this seems to be not an a singular incident that child spirits are oftentimes playing and having fun and mm -hmm. pretty much enjoying what they're doing for the time being exactly um it, it does seem often that spirits child or adult they're they're going about their business as we go about ours yes and uh, and sometimes getting mischievous. Well, and, as we all spiteful. do. Yeah, yeah uh, we all do or, time. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know does remind me of the the girl who haunts the the old English inn in uh, in, mm -hmm. in Hollister. Which, yeah. Oh, there's. I'm coming back to one. What to me one of the more interesting. Uh, uh, Texas phenomena would be one that's simply titled gargoyle. Yeah, um, I, I, I found that a bit interesting as well. It's uh, in 1986, uh, NASA archivist named Frank Shaw encountered a creature that haunted him for the rest of his life. Or we, we're assuming that the experience left him haunted. And again, this is from exemplar.com, top 10 cryptid still lurking around Texas. Uh, while work, leaving work, Shaw uh, looked up and saw the 
uh, pitch black monster perched on the roof of the building. He described the Texas cryptid as being a large human-like figure wearing a long cape with two massive wings. I'm also assuming that the creature had the cape, not had the wings and not the cape having the wings. But that's just my editor's heart. Um, when the archivist reported um, the incident to his boss, he was made aware of a secret file they had been keeping on the creature. Insert conspiracy theory here. Um, not many stories about this gargoyle are known to the public, but this story, knowing that NASA has a file on the monster, is enough to send chills up your spine. Um, Mothman's been getting around and he bought a trench coat. See, that's that's exactly what I was going to say is, uh, you know, Mothman left uh, West Virginia and went to NASA. <laughs> Headed to Houston. Um, not impossible. <laughs> it it no. is something that I, I think is, is particularly fascinating about uh, cryptids that fly is that we can surmise that they might be anywhere. Well, that, I mean, that's true. I mean, um, there, there were uh, a number of, uh, a cluster of sightings, basically the same thing um, in Chicago a few years ago around, um, I think Midway Airport. I think it was Midway. It was one of the airports, but I think it was Midway. So you just, you don't know. But, you know, if it can fly, it does not have to, figure out a way to get across the rivers. That's true, or hitchhike. Or hitchhike. <laughs> <laughs> one, one advantage over <laughs> the weepy woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the truth is, after all these years, La Llorona really isn't grieving for her children anymore. She's just trying to hitchhike to Whataburger. That's right. <laughs> Just wants a ride. <laughs> Just wants a ride and uh, some fries with some milk gravy. <laughs> the <laughs> oh, uh, this is a South Texas legend, but uh, uh, San Patricio County's Road to Hell, um, driving down Farm to Market Road six six six, and that yeah, uh, that might have not contributed to the legend growing up. I can't imagine it having anything to do with it. Uh, um, uh, along the county road sits the old San Patricio courthouse where Chupita Rodriguez, the first woman ever to be hung in Texas, was sentenced for a crime that she did not commit. Chupita was taken to a grove of trees along the Oasis River, a few miles behind the courthouse and the present day highway and was hanged from the tallest oak tree. Uh, she was buried in a coffin along the banks of the river under the tree from which she was hanged and Chupita's ghost reportedly glides on the riverbanks where her cries echo into the mesquite. It is appropriately urban legend haunting right there. It is, but it fits square into the weeping lady motif. 100%, uh, although I swear Farm to Market Road 666 has to be, you know, have, have a direct conduit to Zombie Road in St. Louis. There's a portal. <laughs> yes. That's Direct link. You just dial up. Um, <laughs> you get a connect connecting route to Alpine Farm. <laughs> to the basement and Albino Farm. There you go. <laughs> we are kidding. We are kidding. Yes, we are. Yes. We're really kidding. Um, I also found the, the South Texas... Um, Headless Horseman, um, a wealthy Kentuckian had come to Texas for a land purchase in the early 1800s, found the quaint town of San Patricio to be his last stop. He said that the wealthy man lost his gold to thieves along with his head, and he reportedly roams the night along Headless Horseman Hill, which flows, um, flows, flows from Mathis to San Patricio. What, th there are so many dating back to Elizabethan times to earlier of headless apparitions. Mm -hmm. There are so many. And you, on one hand, you can just say it's um, the, the, the confluence of legend and literature 
Thank mm -hmm. you, Washington Irving, so on and so forth. However, Washington Irving was listening to these types of stories also. Um, yeah, he was, he, he, he was basically writing a new version of old tales, yeah. And we have uh, lore of a disembodied uh, apparition, disembodied, or a, a headless phantom in a villa where we know that a man lost his head or a corpse of a man lost his head. There's uh, the, the story of a, of, a, of a headless phantom walking down Old Highway 13 in mm -hmm. Stone County, uh, which is not far from Yoakum Pond or Ghost Pond. Right. There's one um, along the highway at Wablo up mm -hmm. in Fulton County. Yep. Uh, what What are your thoughts in terms of a of a of an apparition manifesting itself headless? Um, well, I think in part, you know, a lot of these seem to be associated with tales of where someone actually did lose their head. Um, yes. And I think that it is such a, a um, an intense um, violent act that it affects someone even more than regular murder um, mm -hmm. that um, and particularly if the head is separated from the body yes um, that it it becomes a focal point of, of unrest uh, similar to um, an unmarked grave seems to have that same effect that sometimes um, you know an unmarked or desecrated grave will create this you know the restless spirit and yeah. <laughs> and the, I, I guess the idea of not being whole although why? i'm not really sure why mm -hmm. you know i a lot of this particular lore has been lost uh, but one of the things that we do know about the celts is that they held uh the the disembodied head mm -hmm. Uh, in extraordinary spiritual significance yeah that, that it it was a, a concept a, a religious motif that mm -hmm. was considered to be extraordinarily important and i think that's that's worth considering that there was certainly the ancient celts as well as potentially other um people groups in in antiquity but certainly we know that the celts considered uh, the the separation uh, to have some sort of deep resonance within the spiritual realm. Yes, and it, it does seem to bear out with these tales and for people who um, encounter these apparitions that um, there does seem to be something to it. Yes. So, so if you happen to see a headless phantom, um, just bear in mind that it's an important part of our culture and heritage. And be respectful. And be respectful. And, uh, and you know, maybe you do a lot of research and help him find his head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one's probably a push. That was, that was a reach. But it's a nice thought. <laughs> nice thought. So this image of you know here. Yes. <laughs> here. Happy birthday. And <laughs> perhaps on on that um, visionary um, note, um, we we might conclude here. Yes. Uh, but we want to remind everyone not to forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkosarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. And thank you again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping to bring the Dark Ozarts to everyone. And on the next episode, we're going to be discussing various aspects related to the Eastern Ozarks, perhaps specifically related 
to the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, as well as other things. Catch the Dark Ozarks podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other podcast platforms. Thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks.